How does that work? How's it going? Bizarro here again with test subjects. And before I show you how I did that, uh, I want you to take a guess how I accomplished it down in the comments. I'm kidding, that's stupid. I'm here to talk to you today about the TTP223 touch sensor. This is probably the best touch sensor that I have found on the market. And it's in a lot of uh, electronics and things that you probably have encountered, you just don't know it because it's inside. And I know it's a little hard to see, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to uh, make it a little bigger for you. Now, you'll notice that it has a few interesting features. One, it has this little touch circle there, which is normally where you would have to touch the thing to make it activate, as well as the letter A and B. And what those are is little jumpers that let you achieve a high or low trigger, as well as latching or momentary functionality, which can be very handy. But the important thing for this video is gonna be this little solder pad here. And what that does is if you put an antenna on it, it increases the read range by quite a bit, which is how I turned this into this. So I've kind of got this in this strange configuration to show you how this works here. Now, normally with these little red sensors, uh, on the back, you have to be within a few millimeters of the word touch on the back of it there. But once you solder something to this little antenna here, which I'm going to disconnect real quick, like this, once you solder a little antenna to it, it increases the read range, right? And so I'm gonna turn this on, I'm gonna plug it in here with uh, five volts, and it's gonna have a, a little bit of a, uh, like a sensing area, a, a, it gets a reading of the area that it's in, so it can get a baseline, right? And so now with this antenna here, I can get a little closer to it, and the read range increases quite a bit, as you can see there. That's actually way more than what it normally would be, as you can see, which is cool. Now, if you run this and attach it to something else, uh, a different object or objects, uh, it increases the read range even more depending on what it is you've hooked it up to. So I'm gonna unplug it and I will re-stick it to this. And this is the gemstone you saw at the beginning. And I'm gonna show you how I made this here in a little bit, but first I wanna show you kind of what's going on here. So I have plugged that in, let it get a baseline, let it get its reading. And then you can see now that the read range is a lot bigger now here. Uh, but I can still touch it directly. I can go right up to it and go boop like this. But if I get around it, the read range is increased by quite a bit, which is pretty impressive uh, for what this is. Now this may work for something you need, uh, or it may not. Uh, here in a minute, I'll show you something that I made this for. It goes on a shield, but the shield is a lot of metal, which means it just was hitting this with all sorts of interference and stuff like that. You can see there, I'm getting close to it and it doesn't like it. Poke at it, poke at it, poke at it. Anyway, this is the shield I was telling you about here. This entire thing becomes an antenna and causes a lot of interference once this is attached to it. So what I had to do to basically turn this back into just a regular touch sensor where it doesn't have as crazy a range was to put, put a screw here into the shield and then attach this into the ground. And so you either have to attach it to something that this is a uh, part of or into the ground of another electronic that is controlling it like an escape keeper or whatever like that. So I just wanted to show you that sometimes you may have to trick the electronics into doing what you want. So now I'll show you how I turned a gemstone into a button, right? Uh, to start out with, we're gonna use some clear resin. This is Crystal Clear 200 from Smooth On, you can see there. Uh, and it is unfortunately not a one-to-one -one mixture, it is a 100 to 90. And so I've already measured out part of it. I got part B here, and I'll pour a little bit of part A into this. So first thing we're gonna do is use my little uh, scale here that does a bunch of different stuff. It's set to grams. Zero the scale out like this. And now uh, we're going to pour approximately 126 grams of part A here. Hold on a second, here we go. Do, 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 do. Oh, there we go. The, the, the one of the reasons using grams, is, especially for small batches of stuff, is it's very precise. And don't worry about the work time on this. That was 
a little more than I planned on. So I'm going to pour just a smidge back in there. There we go. You want to be as close as possible uh, to your ratio. Otherwise, it could affect the cure time of this stuff. And, oop, there's some on the scale. That's not good. Uh, and so just be very careful uh, when doing this. And if you go over, you just pour some back in like I just did right there. All right. So now uh, we got 126 and 113 ish, 114, whatever. So that's pretty close to that. We do not need the scale anymore. Uh, to color this, I have some transparent pigment here. This is Cast and Craft. Smooth On makes their own stuff. There's a bunch of different uh, companies who make pigments specifically for resin and things like that. And uh, this is a nice emerald green. So I'm going to add this. Uh, into here, quite a bit of it actually, because what I found is the transparent pigments uh, come out a little weaker than uh, than the than the other kind there. So we mix this up to uh, see kind of the color that we want to achieve right there, and that doesn't look too bad. That's a nice nice green color right there, nice see through green. And what's going to happen next is we are going to put the mix these together and then put them in my pressure uh, vacuum chamber, not pressure pot, vacuum chamber. Uh, and that is to get rid of the bubbles inside of this. So uh, we're going to mix this up real quick and then we will uh, vacuum suck it. <laughs> now, this may not look like it has a lot of bubbles in it. Uh, and it doesn't have a ton uh, because of how liquidy it, liquidy it is, but there's more in there than you think. So I'm going to place this inside of my vacuum chamber here, and we're going to suck all the bubbles out of it using this device here. So uh, you can get, uh, there's different versions of these you can get online and stuff like that. Um, this is the one I got years ago, and it works very well uh, for my uses. So let's turn this on and you will, you hear it going there, and with any luck, you'll be able to see the, uh, the bubbles and stuff. That's enough. We let out the air slowly so as to not blow more air into the cup. But <laughs> now you may be wondering why I have blocks of wood inside of this chamber. And that is because to put something that small inside of such a large chamber, it actually takes longer to pull, uh, pull a vacuum. So having other stuff in there helps get the vacuum quicker. I could put more blocks and stuff inside of there. Uh, but when you're doing small amounts like this, it's good to put other things inside. So it, uh, it pulls a vacuum faster. This mold is something I got online. Uh, they come in different sizes. They have smaller ones. They even have bigger ones than this. I like this size. This is a nice little, nice little hand size thing here. This is like a three inch gemstone. Uh, for those of you who are Zelda fans, you may recognize this as a rupee mold, if you will. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to pour uh, the, the resin on the stick into the mold. What happens is it runs down the stick and breaks up any bubbles that might be there on the surface tension like that. So I'm going to do that for you real quick. You can see that I just come up here and I'm going to pour down the stick and that helps I said, break up any air bubbles that may or may not be chilling out in there. Try not to, and I don't move it around. I let it kind of find its, its level, if you will. I'm going to pour all that into the mold like that. There we go. Normally, this is where you'd be done with like a mold making thing, but uh, we're needing to turn this into a sensor. So I had to kind of figure out like a weird uh, jig to get a, a wire inside of this thing. And so this is what I came up with. I have here a piece of plastic 
And I chose plastic, uh, and not paper, in case this touched it uh, and it wouldn't soak up into it. So this is just a piece of styrene I had laying around with a tiny pinhole you can see right there inside of it. So I am going to take a piece of black wire right here. I'm going to focus in on that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to strip it back pretty far like this. So now I've stripped the wire out to here and I'm going to twist it until uh, into a braid so there's no loose ends or anything like that. So you can see here, that is now my situation. That is braided up like this. Uh, we're going to run this through the wire like this. And I'm going to tape this down here using just a piece of tape. So if this is just to prevent this from moving around like this. So now this is my situation, but I need to kind of make a little coil here. Let me bring that out a bit. We don't need, we don't need that part 100% sticking in there. So I'm going to make kind of a coil that this can act as an antenna inside of our resin. And I can kind of check the level here. There we go. Yep. I can look down and make sure it's not touching the very front of the resin right there. And what we're going to do is we're going to take, and I'm going to set this on top of this. And that's it. That's all I have to do. I do want to try to, to center it, obviously, as best I can. Uh, and now I just leave this for a day, for 24 hours. Uh, this clear resin is notorious for needing about 24 hours, depending on the thickness of what you're doing because of the reaction. It's a very slow cure. There are quick curing clear resins. I believe the Crystal Clear 202 uh, is within like 90 minutes, but you can't, you shouldn't cast things this thick with it. It's meant for smaller thicknesses and stuff like that. So this is going to sit for a day. And then when we come back, we'll pop it out and test it and see if it works. All right, uh, the gemstone has now solidified here in the mold. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this piece of tape off because we don't need that anymore like that. And then we're going to pull the, uh, the piece of plastic off of here like this. And as you can see, our gemstone is bubble free. There's nothing going on on the top. Uh, sometimes you'll get little tiny bubbles that got trapped here in the top of the, of your uh, mold. And one of the things you can do is you can take a blowtorch or like a creme brulee torch and just kind of go and it'll pop all those surface bubbles like that. Uh, it's a neat little trick. So uh, because this is a polypropylene mold, we just got to flex it a little bit, get a little bit of a little push. You can hear the cracks as it comes free there, just like that. And then boom, just like that, you have a gemstone. Now you can polish this up and, and whatnot, but this is, this is our, our thing right here. So now I'm going to show you how to wire it up and make it work. So here is our setup. Uh, I'm going to try to make this as easy to understand as possible, hopefully. Uh, you have three ports here. You have ground, I.O., or signal, and VCC, which is positive. And so I have power running into the ground and the VCC from a 5-volt power supply. Now these can take 2 to 5.5 volts, which means they have a good operating range. And they also output voltage, so you don't need separate voltage if you're triggering one particular thing. And in this case, uh, I have an LED back here behind the gemstone that is going to be turned on when I touch the sensor here. And so because this is set as a low trigger, because I have jumpered, uh, actually, I don't think I've jumpered anything. I think this is the default setting I've got it on right now, which means it is a momentary low trigger. And so I also have a wire running to here to ground and the wire running out of IO. And those are going to the LED back here. Ground is going to the ground. IO is going to the positive, And that is our setup. Of course, we also have this antenna here wired to this. And this is going to come out to our freshly poured gemstone right here and create our touch sensor. So now if I plug this in, boop let it take a reading. When I go to touch the gemstone, you should see it light up from the LED, just like that. And there you go. It is just that easy. Now, there is a way to trigger 12 volt items from these sensors here. And the way to do that involves transistors and diodes and resistors and things like that. And that information is online if you want to look into that. 
or you can do what I did with this other one from the earlier demo here, and I put a 12 volt LED strip inside of this, and it is wired to an escape keeper. Now, when you wire something like this to an escape keeper, you have to put the five volts um, through here. If five volts get powered through the inputs, and then the outputs are outputting the 12 volts for the LED strip, and or you can use an output expander which is what we have here going on. So uh, there's a few ways to interface this with different stuff. If you're using an Arduino, obviously you don't have to worry about that because Arduino is five volts, 3.3 volts, things like that. But at the base, if you just need to do one thing, you don't need any of that involved. You just need one thing to light up and do something cool. This is your setup here. And of course you can hook this up to an input or an output or a relay or how to do something like that. These give you a lot of cool options and it is just that easy. I think it's really cool that something this small gives you so many options to make buttons out of things that may not necessarily be buttons. So maybe you wanna take music notes and have the players touch or wave their hand in front of them to make music and do it in the right order to make a song. If you make something cool, we wanna see it as always. Send it down to us at testsubjects.com. And if you wanna learn more stuff, we have other videos. We teach, we talk about, we do a little show and tell, and a little bit of everything in between. So feel free to subscribe so you don't miss any of that, and we'll see you next time.